So a couple weeks ago, one of my viewers left me a comment and he said, you know, you need to do a video about how you pick which wood you're going to use for which project. Because for those of us just starting out, it's a total mystery. How do you choose between maple and purple heart and cherry? Which wood is good for which thing? Do a video about that. And I was like, damn, that is a really good idea. I should do a video about that. And then immediately I started second guessing myself because I'm like, Jesus, this is an enormous topic and it's full of rules and there are exceptions to all of these rules and all sorts of crazy distinctions. And that just sounds like a lot. But then I thought, you know what? I should just talk about me and my own personal experience as a craftsman because what else could I really talk about with any authority anyway? So here is my painfully brief, completely oversimplified, guaranteed to get nitpicked to death in the comments, Guide to Picking Woods for Woodworking. I know, the title is not great. I I've got a guy working on that. He's gonna come up with something very soon. So I live in North America, kind of right in the middle of North America, actually. And the city I live in, Cleveland, Ohio, is one of the most heavily forested cities on the entire continent. So I very rarely use imported or exotic woods because I have a big selection of high quality, affordable woods right here. In my own mind, I tend to separate woods into four categories. Softwoods, easy working hardwoods, tough and springy hardwoods, and ultra hardwoods. You won't find these categories in any book. I just sort of made them up, and I didn't even realize I was using them until I sat down to outline this video. But I think they are a really good way of separating the different kinds of wood you might use for furniture making. Softwoods are conifers, and they stay green all year round. We're talking about pine, spruce, fir, cedar, trees like that. And crucially, these woods are soft. Now right this second, there are a thousand angry wood nerds poised over their keyboards, getting ready to tell me all the exceptions to this rule and how there are some softwoods that are harder than hardwoods and blah blah blah. Boys, put a sock in it. All the softwoods I'm going to talk about are softer than all the hardwoods I'm going to talk about, and it's a generally good distinction, so there's no reason for us to go confusing the beginners. People usually associate softwoods with things like building construction because they're strong, lightweight, and inexpensive. And they don't typically think of them as furniture woods, but I love to make furniture out of softwoods because it's strong, lightweight, and inexpensive. And people have been making furniture out of softwoods for a really long time. It's a great material for chair seats, boxes, blanket chests, stuff like that. And people like farmers or laborers made their furniture out of softwoods because, well, they could get it. That's a great reason to use a wood. If you can get your hands on it, go ahead and make something out of it. For instance, I made this milking stool right here, and I made the seat out of pine. This is just some 2x6 material that I got from the home center, and I'm super happy with the way it looks, even though it's like four years old. The wood was very easy to work. I did it entirely with hand tools, and it really wasn't difficult. And then all these years later, the wood still looks really pretty. People often describe white pine as having a glowing quality to it. It's kind of shiny. I've got a couple coats of polyurethane and some furniture wax on here, and that's protected the surface. Even though we use it as a chair and a step stool literally every day, it's been very durable and it's held up great. But wait a second. Didn't I just go on a whole thing about how softwoods are soft? How am I going to sit here and tell you that softwoods are also durable? Well, it's actually a little bit complicated. Softwoods are soft because they're not very dense. They're really good at, you know, not falling over and not breaking because those are qualities that trees need to have. And so they're excellent for housing construction. They're also good for making some parts of furniture, like seats. But the softness of softwoods is really in the surface softness. They're very easy to dent and ding. So while you might see a table or a desktop made of pine sometimes, it's rarely the top choice. People usually make high wear surfaces out of hardwoods like oak because they're going to stand up to things like people's hands and jewelry and silverware getting knocked all over them all day long. A pine top isn't going to work as well for that, but it works great for other things. You could even build a dresser or a nightstand out of pine. That would work out just fine. For making fine furniture, I go directly to category number two, my easy working hardwoods. These are woods like cherry, walnut, soft maple, and poplar. And these are probably familiar names if you've done any amount of woodworking. These woods are really popular for cabinetry and other fine furniture because they've got perfect characteristics. They're hardwoods, but they're on the softer side. And more importantly, they're what's called diffuse porous woods. That means the pores, the veins that actually take nutrients around the tree, are scattered 
evenly around the wood, and the pores are very small. That means the wood has a very even texture, it leaves a fine finish, and it's a homogeneous material. So no matter what you do to it, it's really unlikely to splinter or chip like some harder woods are. So with these easy working hardwoods, you can plane, saw, bore, and even use abrasive technologies like sanding and rasping, and the wood is going to give you a pretty good surface and a good result almost no matter what. Most of these woods are pretty expensive, but they've been popular for furniture work for a really long time because they fall right into this sweet spot where they're soft enough to be workable, hard enough to be durable, and very attractive. A good example, for instance, is cherry. I love working with cherry, and I think all woodworkers I know like working with cherry because it's very easy to work with and it leaves a beautiful result, especially when you put some finish on it. It just comes alive with a lovely sort of pinkish color. Walnut is another really common choice. It seems like these days everybody loves it, especially for those giant slab tables filled with liquid plastic or whatever. And I think walnut's great. It's probably my favorite all-around wood because it's beautiful and it's easy to work. It's a lot like cherry. Now, up until pretty recently, I didn't use soft maple and I had kind of never heard of it. I'm from Connecticut where we have sugar maple and that yields a wood called rock maple. And it's called that for a reason. It is extraordinarily hard. But then I moved to Ohio and in Ohio we have silver maple trees and silver maple trees give you soft maple. What's amazing about it is that it looks almost exactly like hard maple. It has the same pale color and beautiful flowing grain and flame texture, all that good stuff. But it's so much easier to work than rock maple. It's almost exactly like cherry. So it's very easy to do stuff with and it even costs less. So for a lot of places where I would have used rock maple before, now I use soft maple. I save a little money and everything looks the same. The last wood I want to talk about here is poplar. And this is one that's not nearly as popular among woodworkers because it's kind of ugly, honestly. The wood can often be this very streaky color with green in it and some darker colors. It doesn't stain very well. It's not particularly attractive. But for a long time, poplar has still been used a lot as what's called a secondary wood. So if you were making a really fancy piece of furniture, like a chest of drawers for a high-end client, it would be really common to make all the outside in an expensive, fancy-looking wood like cherry. But then all the inside parts would be made using a secondary wood, like poplar. And the secondary wood has the same working characteristics as cherry. It's easy to work and unlikely to splinter, but it's much, much cheaper, and it's only going to be in places where you're not going to see it, like the drawer components and the casework. By using a primary wood that's expensive and fancy, and a secondary wood, like poplar, that's ugly but cheap, you can make a really nice piece of furniture and not go out of business. And while poplar is very difficult to stain, it's not very difficult to dye, and woodworkers have access to more and better dyes than we ever did in the past. Actually, I just thought of something. Hold on a second. This is a lap steel guitar that I made about 10 years ago when I was pretty new to woodworking. And believe it or not, this thing is made entirely out of poplar. Uh, I used poplar because I was living in Florida, there wasn't a good lumber yard nearby, and the big box store had plenty of poplar. I knew that it was difficult to stain, so I got some dye. I got Phoebing's Leather Dye, which is still my absolute favorite for getting a black, sort of ebonized look on wood. But the great thing about dyeing poplar is that it takes the dye very evenly, you get a dark, rich color, but the grain still shows through. So by using dye instead of stain, you can still get a really beautiful result even using an inexpensive and easy to work wood. So we've covered our fancy cabinet woods, but you might have a project where you need a wood to be not only harder, but also tougher, able to withstand a lot more mechanical strain. For projects like this, I recommend you go to our tough, springy hardwoods, category number three. Not only are these woods harder and denser than our easy working cabinet woods, they have a completely different internal structure. These woods are diffuse porous, open poured woods. That means that all the pores in the wood are arranged in very clear, distinct rings. If you look at the end of a piece of diffuse porous wood, those rings will jump right out at you. And that structure makes these woods behave very differently. For one thing, they're much stronger and much more able to stand up to mechanical strain because they have these very long parallel strands of extremely tough 
fibers. So for instance, I've got a very thin piece of oak right here, and even though it's tiny, it is extremely hard to bend because it's very strong, but it's also extremely tough, which means that instead of breaking, it flexes a little bit under strain and then returns to its original shape. This is an extremely handy property for building. As an example, let's go back to the milking stool that I made. I made the seat out of pine because it doesn't need to stand up to a huge amount of mechanical stress, but these legs don't have any stretchers or cross pieces to reinforce them. They're just led into the top with simple round tenons, so all the mechanical force is right here. I have to use an extremely strong wood for that, and this red oak does the job beautifully. I don't think I could pull these apart even if I used my maximum strength, and these are fairly small pieces of wood. A wood like oak is really ideal for a situation like this, where there's going to be a lot of strain over and over again, and the piece needs to be durable for years. You also need to understand that diffuse porous woods work a little bit differently than our easy working cabinet woods or our soft woods. They're very easy to work when you're going with the grain. So when you're doing planing, whittling, working with a draw knife, or even sanding, you get a good result with not a lot of trouble. The problem happens when you go cross grain. That very tough, stringy structure makes these woods susceptible to splintering. So when you're sawing, routing, boring, or turning, you're much more likely to get chip out and big splinters that tear out chunks of the wood. This isn't a deal breaker. You can still use these woods to make all sorts of things, but you have to get used to them. If you're using machine tools, make sure they're very sharp and experiment with different speeds. People make great stuff out of these, but it takes a little bit of extra care to figure out exactly how to handle them. Diffuse porous woods also split very easily. And that sounds like a bad thing, but it's not. Most woodworkers don't think about splitting as being a process they want to use in the shop, but it can be extremely efficient. For instance, if I have a board like this and I want to cut it in half, rather than ripping it, I might just split it in half and then quickly clean it up with a hand plane. Depending on the piece of wood I'm working on, this might be much faster than sawing. It might even be faster than using a power tool. I can also use splitting to my advantage when I'm making furniture components. So while I'm working on this tenon, I'm definitely going to saw the shoulders. But when I go to do the cheeks, I can either saw them or just split them and then pare them down to size. This is another place where using the wood's tendency to split might be much quicker and more efficient. These techniques won't work with woods like cherry and walnut because they don't split in straight, predictable lines. But oak ash and hickory split extremely easily, and it's easy to look at the grain and just tell where the split's going to go. You can incorporate these techniques into your woodworking with just a little bit of practice. These tough and springy hardwoods aren't necessarily the first choice for fine furniture making, but they are perfectly acceptable, and you will see lots of pieces of wood, especially made out of oak. That's really popular in American furniture. But ash works out really well, too. I made the doors of this humidor out of ash, and I stained them to match the Spanish cedar of the case. The client was very happy, and using ash let me keep the cost pretty low. You'll also see lots of things like desks and tables made out of oak. The attractive grain and super hard characteristics make it perfect for any surface that's going to get a lot of abuse. Now, the one thing you do need to know about making fine furniture out of diffuse porous woods is those big open pores are going to show up on the surface of the wood, and they're extremely deep. If you think you're going to fill those just by putting on a lot of finish, you're probably going to be disappointed. If you want a very smooth or glossy finish, you're going to need to fill those pores with something. As an example, I built this guitar out of swamp ash, which is just a more open-grained version of ash, and I knew that the grain was going to have to be filled when I went to do the final finish. So I made a mixture of drywall mud and black dye, and I pushed that into the pores before I did the clear coat. I dyed the wood red, and so the entire effect is this beautiful red background with these very dramatic grain lines in black. Since I had the open grain structure to deal with anyway, I decided to just use it as an advantage and try to make something that looked more dramatic. In this case, the open grain nature of the wood made it more fun to work with, not less. In my own work, I sometimes need a wood that'll stand up to a lot of wear or friction, or sometimes I just need something that looks unusual. In these circumstances, I go to my ultra hard woods. For domestics, that pretty much means rock maple. It is an outstanding wood with beautiful grain, very easy to dye and finish into lovely colors, and it's just super, super hard, which makes it a little bit tough to work, but you kind of figure it out over time. And then this is where I sometimes incorporate some exotics into my work. For instance, I really love Purple Heart because it's, you know, purple. And that color can make it sort of mm, 
tacky and garish, but if you use it tastefully and occasionally, it can give your work that extra pop that really makes it stand out. Purple Heart is also extraordinarily hard and dense wood, and that can be useful sometimes. I've used it for mechanical components when I make my own tools or my own machines because it can stand up to an incredible amount of wear and friction before it breaks down. I also sometimes use Ipe. Ipe is another imported hardwood that's extremely hard and tough. I, for instance, turned this little vase out of Ipe with a rim made out of maple, and it just looks really nice. It feels sturdy and solid, as if it was made out of ceramic, really, and um, with an epoxy finish on it, it also holds water and flowers, so it functions as a vase. Uh, it was very difficult to actually make it. I turned it on the lathe with carbide tools, and it was still a challenge, but it sits on my kitchen table and it stays there because everybody in my family really loves it. So this is a case where using ePay was worth the extra challenge because the final piece is durable and pretty. So let's finish this up by looking at a single piece of furniture and the way I used multiple different woods to get the overall piece that I needed. So this is a workout bench. My wife needed it to do angled push-ups, step-up exercises, jumping exercises, and a bunch of other exercises that I totally don't understand. She is in really good shape. And she needed this bench to be a whole bunch of different things. Of course, it needed to be strong and durable, but it also needed to be lightweight so she could move it around quickly and not get bogged down during her workouts. And it's going to live in our living room, which means that it has to blend in with the rest of our furniture, because sometimes when we have company, we pull this thing out for extra seating. So it's got to kind of look like the rest of our stuff. That's a lot of requirements for a single piece, and I made all those things happen by combining five different timbers in the one piece of furniture. For the top of the bench, I used Douglas fir. It's a soft wood, but it has an extremely high strength to weight ratio. So even though it's very strong, it's super light. I can pick it up and move it around really easily. And the top is very rigid. Even when I jump on top of this thing, you can't see it flex or move at all. I also used reclaimed Doug fir because pretty much every old building in Cleveland has Douglas fir for its floor joists and ceiling rafters. It's easy to buy this stuff for pennies, and it's got a lot of great detail, water stains, interesting grain, and little nail holes that make it look interesting without making it look like garbage. When I went to make the legs, I needed them to be really strong too, but I still had to keep weight down. So just like the milking stool, I went with red oak. It's extremely strong, but it's not very dense, so it didn't add much to the overall weight of the piece. Now, red oak is kind of fragile and splintery because of its low density. So here, on the edges of the legs, I routed in some chamfers. If these met at sharp corners, they'd be very likely to get dinged and splinter. Chamfering them makes that pretty much impossible. And then for the chamfer, I just used a simple 45 degree bit, and that gave me very smooth entrance and exits and a very straight cut. With no sharp lines or corners, it was very unlikely that the tool was gonna to cause the work to splinter. When I went to do the feet of the bench, they had to be wider than the top to keep the whole thing stable. But because they stick out, I knew they were likely to get kicked and knocked around a ton. So I had to switch to a harder and denser wood. I went with white oak on these. It's actually a lot harder and denser than red oak, and so it's been able to stand up to all the chaos of just being in the family room. I also wanted to route in this little roundover detail with a rabbit. That's a sharp detail to put in the wood, and a lot of stringy hardwoods would chip out when I'm doing this, but white oak has a much smoother texture than other stringy hardwoods, so it was able to take this detail with no trouble. And then, I also needed a piece of wood to act as the stretcher because when weight was applied to the middle of the bench, I didn't want the legs to move out in this direction. I could have used pretty much anything here, because all it's doing is applying a little bit of tension. But I also decided to attach the stretcher to the feet using a slightly fancy dovetail joint. I was showing off a tiny bit, but I wanted it to be subtle and not jump out at the viewer too much. So I picked tulip wood. It's a hardwood, so it's going to play nice with oak when they're joined together, and it's got a similar color to oak, but a very different grain structure. So if anybody cares to look, they'll notice a nice little detail, but it's not going to jump out and overwhelm the viewer. It's tasteful. Taste is a new thing I'm trying in the stuff that I make. I'll tell you how it works out. As a final detail, I mortised the legs straight through the top with this round tenon that I turned on the lathe. And then to lock it in place, I slit that tenon and drove in a wedge made of walnut. And I'm sure you're thinking, oh, does walnut make a good wedge material? No, not at all. 
It's really much too soft and it breaks too easily, but I love the way that the dark walnut looks against the light colored oak and Douglas fir. So I pretty much always use walnut for my wedges. I just make twice as many wedges as I think I'll need and I throw away the ones that break. It's one of the few decisions I make purely for the way that it looks and I have no regrets. So a video like this could never possibly cover everything about wood selection, but I think what I did is actually cover everything that I really think about when it comes to wood selection. Because I do 99% of my work with six or eight common locally sourced species. And I kind of recommend that you do that too. Get to know half a dozen readily available, inexpensive woods and try to make everything you can out of those woods. Instead of introducing a new wood with each project that you do. Every time you bring in a new wood, there are new challenges and new things that you have to learn, and that's only going to slow you down. If you find this topic interesting, I also highly recommend this book, With the Grain, A Craftsman's Guide to Wood by Christian Bexavort. It is by far my favorite book on the topic of wood characteristics and wood behavior. It covers a ton of North American species. I literally look at this book at least once a week, and I can't say that about any other woodworking book that I own. And if you enjoyed this video, you might want to become a supporter, because these videos are brought to you by my patrons on Patreon. If you're interested in supporting educational DIY videos like this, go on over to patreon.com slash Rex Kruger and check out the early access, exclusive content, and rewards that I have only for my patrons. And before I go, I want to give a quick shout out to my colleague, Neil McKinley. He's a Scottish woodworker who made woodworking YouTube videos for a really long time, and recently he sort of stopped doing that and started a podcast, which is totally not about woodworking. It's just about him talking to people and politics and current events and funny, humorous stuff. I don't know, it's hard to explain, but he's a hilarious guy. I really love what he does, and I think more people should listen to his podcast. It is totally for grown-ups. There's a lot of cursing and stuff, but if you like that sort of thing, I will drop a link in the description. He needs more listeners, so go check that out. And to everybody who's watching this video, thanks so much for watching.